Let's delve into another class ranking, my brave companions. The time has come to take a look at the Warlock, a class that has risen from obscurity to great prominence in Dungeons & Dragons. In first edition, there is no class called the Warlock, though sometimes the term is used to refer to wizards or arcane spellcasters. Then, in 1996, in the middle of second edition, there came the supplement Player's Option, Spells and Magic. This gave a variant wizard called the Warlock, who received his magical abilities from a powerful extraplanar being. He used spell points instead of prepared spells, and there was an element of danger to using this dark wizard subclass, as you risked becoming completely enslaved by the patron. In 2004, in the midst of 3.5 edition, the complete Arcana book presented for the first time the Warlock as its own class. It was a magical class, yet distinct in that it did not have spells per se. It introduced the novel idea of at-will magic. Yes, that's where that comes from. It came via Eldritch Blast. This initial entry also included certain warlock aspects that we know of today, such as the invocations and the enhancements to Eldritch Blast, along with the light armor proficiency and a hit die that was one step tougher than a wizard. The release of 4th edition in 2008 saw the Warlock truly come into the forefront. It was one of the core classes in the player's handbook. Here is where the Warlock's lore and flavor developed into having the option of the different patrons. The Fiend, the Archfey, the Great Old One, etc. 5e continues with the trends set in place by 4e and 3.5e and develop the Warlock even further, again placing it as a core class in the PHB, and arguably one of the best classes in the edition. I do have my criticisms of the Warlock class, as many other people do, but the storytelling and the flavor that are part of the Warlock really make it stand out in a darkly appealing way. For the purpose of this ranking, I'm gonna go through the general Warlock features from levels one through 20, rating each of them from F to S tier. Then I'll go through all the various patron and packed features. By the end of the video, we'll get a ranking of the Warlock subclasses as compared to each other. Hit die. The Warlock has a D8 hit die, which is the average hit die in the game. It's not terrible, but not great. Overall, the Warlock is not known for its defensive capabilities or toughness, but as with everything in D&D, there are always options to bolster this. Armor. Warlocks are proficient with light armor, and that's it. Better than just wearing a robe. Weapons. Warlocks are proficient with all simple weapons, so grab yourself a quarterstaff, a spear, or a sacrificial dagger for those rare cases in which you make a melee weapon attack. Saving throws. Wisdom and Charisma. Probably the best baseline saving throw proficiencies to have. No one ever wants to fail any save but Wisdom and Charisma generally are the saves you really, really don't want to fail. They have to do with mind control and being flung into different planes of existence. Skills and Tools. You are proficient with two skills from Arcana, Deception, History, Intimidation, Investigation, Nature, and Religion, and no tools. Helpful, but nothing to praise Asmodeus over. Pact Magic at first level. A warlock begins having struck a bargain with an otherworldly patron. This pact grants the warlock spells and other magical abilities. A warlock spellcasting works a bit different than all the other classes. The cantrips are the same, they're still unlimited to cast, but the spell slots themselves are very, very limited. However, the warlock regains his spell slots after a short rest not a long rest, and any spell he casts gets cast at the highest level spell slot for his Warlock level. In other words, if you're a seventh level Warlock, you only have a mere two spell slots, but you recover them after only one hour of rest or light activity, and all of your spells get cast as fourth level spells. This does cap out at fifth level spells, but Warlocks do get access to 6th to 9th level spells via Mystic Arcanum. It's also worth noting the Warlock does not receive ritual casting, and the number of spells known is also quite limited. 
So the Wizard and other full casters do have better spellcasting overall, at least in terms of the sheer volume and the variety. But the Warlock spells are still a force to be reckoned with. A final odd point about the Warlock spells is Eldritch Blast. It was a key class feature in the 3.5e Warlock and in 4e. It was a baseline class feature, with all Warlocks knowing Eldritch Blast. But 5e makes no such mention. It's just there on the spell list, as though it's any old option to take or leave. Yet, everyone knows that every Warlock chooses Eldritch Blast, and the majority of Warlocks choose at least one invocation to enhance it. Many people believe that Eldritch Blast is the most powerful damage cantrip in 5e, and if you do the math, it's true, particularly if you factor in Agonizing Blast, which is a very popular invocation for the Warlock. I want to be clear that I really like the idea of Warlocks not having to take Eldritch Blast. I would love to see options for Warlocks that use other great battle cantrips, or just focus on control magic, and I even made a few such cantrips in a recent video slash newsletter feature. I'll put the link down in the video description. But the fact is, 5e does not give this level of support to any other round-by-round -round combat option for the Warlocks. Either make Eldritch Blast a full-on standard class feature, or include other good choices that are also effective and supported. Now I know what some of you are saying, what about Blade Pact? What about Hex Blades? They make melee weapon attacks. That's a great round-by-round -round combat option. That is true, but there's no other magical at-will options that are as supported as Eldritch Blast. And we'll get to the melee stuff soon. In addition to spells, a Warlock receives a number of special abilities called Invocations beginning with two of them at just 2nd level, and gaining an additional one at 5th, 7th, 9th, 12th, 15th, and 18th level. The invocations encompass all kinds of benefits, from enhancements to Eldritch Blast, to access to additional spells, to unique traits like seeing through magical darkness, or casting jump on yourself at will. This has to be one of the coolest features of all the classes in D&D, and honestly, I wish more classes had something like this a broad class feature that provides several different customization options. The Warlock Invocations really deserve their own video because there's quite a lot of them and they fill every kind of niche. Pact Boon, third level. The hits continue just one level later as the Pact Boon comes to the third level Warlock. At this point, the otherworldly patron grants a supernatural gift to you. And there's some great options here. This is where ranking the Warlock does get a little complicated, as the subclasses really are based on the different types of patrons. However, there are also the three different packed boons, so you can mix and match to your heart's content. Honestly, they are all great, and it's difficult to say which is better because they don't necessarily accomplish the same thing. Pact of the Chain gives you the Find Familiar spell and lets you cast it as a ritual, and gives you access to much better familiars than normal. Imp, Sprite, Quasite, and Pseudo-Dragon. Pact of the Blade lets you manifest magical weapons, or turn an existing magical weapon into your Pact weapon, which you can summon into your hand as an action. This Pact is particularly good for Hex Blades, which we'll get to later. And with Pact of the Tome, you learn three additional cantrips from any class's list. Pact of the Chain is probably my personal favorite. The amount of exploring and spying and role-playing that you can get through your improved familiar really is just fantastic. But for those who would rather something that has more direct improvement to combat and damage dealing, Pact of the Blade or Pact of the Tome are probably better. In fact, Pact of the Tome could also be great for utility purposes as well. So it's also a strong contender for my personal favorite. I love cantrips. Pact of the Blade is also great in its own way. It's providing a path to a high damage melee mage warrior. There are no shortage of arguments online as to which pact is the best, and if you feel so inclined, you can spend hours reading through threads that debate how whichever pact is amazing or trash. In the end, 
They're all viable, they're all really flavorful, and they let you play the character that you truly want to play. Mystic Arcanum 11th level. Once you reach 11th level, you learn one 6th level spell which you can cast once per day. The same goes for 7th level spell at Warlock 13, an 8th level spell at Warlock 15, and a 9th level spell at Warlock 17. Again, it's slightly behind the full casters in terms of variety and volume of casting, but these are tremendously powerful spells, and even casting them just once each per day is fantastic. Eldritch Master, 20th level. I feel quite underwhelmed with the Warlock's capstone feature, in a similar way how I felt about the Wizards. Reaching 20th level is an epic feat. It's something that requires months and months, and really more like years of dedication to a campaign. Yes, you can speed level the characters every session, or you can just start the campaign at really high levels, and that's fine, I suppose. But you'll know in your mind that you didn't truly earn all those levels. So achieving the pinnacle of a class brings two things to my mind. One, it should provide an incredible, legendary effect, something that makes you feel godlike, at least for a moment. And two, characters rarely, rarely are 20th level. And if someone does get to that height, they're not going to be playing that character for much longer. So it's shitty to give features like what we see here with the Warlock and the Wizard that have to do with renewing their lower level spells or getting more usage out of low level spells. The campaign's basically over at 20th level. You'll have like one last hurrah or maybe one last dungeon in the form of a god's palace or a demon lord's lair or some other epic location. It's done. No one is going to get excited that they can use the lower half of their spell repertoire more. How about this for a 20th level warlock? You can summon an avatar of your patron once per day. Or even you can become an avatar of your patron. Or what if you actually become an otherworldly patron yourself? Tell me which would you prefer? You can recharge your four spell slots once per day, an ability that you might use once or twice ever, maybe even never before the campaign ends, or you have fulfilled your pact to the highest degree possible, and now you transform into an arch fay, an arch devil, a great old one. That's how you end a bloody 20 level campaign. The pact has been sealed. You have signed in blood, and your fate is now forged. We now look at what amount to the subclasses of the warlock the otherworldly patrons. Each has a different theme that gives you both a strong dose of storyline and style, and a number of additional features. The Archfey. Archfey are the beings of greatest power within the Feywild, on the same level as Elder Dragons, Demon Lords, Titans, and the like. Examples include Titania, the Queen of the Summer Court, Oberon, the Green Lord and Great Hunter of the Woodlands, here some the Prince of Fools and First Satyr, the Prince of Frost, the Queen of Air and Darkness of the Gloaming Court, and Baba Yaga, the Grandmother of Hags. These patrons run the entire alignment spectrum from evil to neutral to good. The only alignment that's truly rare amongst Fae is Lawful, as their kind and their realm leans more towards chaos. Look what I'm offering. Expanded Spell List, Level 1. The first time I helped a player make a 5th edition Warlock character, we filled out his character sheet with him choosing his known spells and then adding to them his patron spells. Makes sense. Just like how a Circle of the Land Druid always has prepared the spells of his terrain type, or how a Cleric always has his domain spells prepared. But wait. Read it again. The expanded spells are merely added to the list of which spells you can choose from. In other words, your patron spells directly compete with the general warlock spells when it comes to choosing which ones you actually know. Warlocks learn very few spells as it is, and merely expanding the list of enticing options that they have to pick from is almost a slap in the face. Lots of people made the same initial mistake that I did. 
because it's counterintuitive that you wouldn't just know your patron's spells. In my games, I personally house rule that warlocks do know these spells, but without that fix, this feature is one of the biggest shortcomings of the warlock class in my opinion. We're going to see this issue repeat with every warlock subclass. The Archface spells largely are illusion and enchantment spells, along with a couple nature-themed utility spells, and there are some nice ones here. Sleep is really great at lower levels. Fairy Fire is nice. Greater Invisibility is awesome. Fey Presence, first level. At just the initial Warlock level, you gain a once per short rest ability to frighten or charm all creatures within 10 feet of you. It only lasts till the end of your next turn, but it costs no spell slot. Situationally during combat or role playing, this could be a nice effect, but you do have to get up really close to the opponents and it does take your action. Misty Escape, level six. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to teleport 60 feet and turn invisible till your next turn. It's a great defensive maneuver, it can really get you out of a sticky situation, and what's more, you can use it once every short rest. Beguiling Defenses, 10th level. Another defensive ability comes to you at 10th level. This time you become permanently immune to being charmed, and when a creature attempts to charm you, you can spend your reaction to reverse the effect. And if the creature fails a wisdom save, you charm it for 10 minutes, or until it takes any damage. The benefit, of course, is quite situational. It could potentially be really good, though unfortunately for some, it may rarely or never come up at all. Dark Delirium, level 14. This feature takes the concept that was set up with Fey Presence and takes it to the next level. As an action, you can target a creature within 60 feet. If it fails a wisdom save, you charm or frighten it for up to one minute, as long as you maintain concentration. This illusion makes the target believe that it's lost in a misty realm of your own design. It can only see you, itself, and the illusory realm. You can use this ability once per short rest, so it's something that you're going to be able to use quite a bit. I love the idea here. It's a unique effect, especially with the ability to create the illusion realm that blocks out the real world for the target. The potential in both combat and role-playing scenes inspires me with this one. So nothing in the Archfey patron struck me as amazing, but it works well overall and it's a great way to have a beguiling, bewildering Fey theme to your character. The Fiend. Look into my eyes. I will show you a new world. A world of possibilities and promise. Fruit ripe for the plucking. Wondrous treasures waiting for you to plunder them. Your quarries will tremble before you, and your foes shall be burnt to ash. I require only your unwavering loyalty. All this and more shall be yours. The Fiend is the most classic warlock patron. It seems quite unwise to wager your soul with the devil, or specifically in D&D, one of the arch devils but it sure does make for an interesting story. Ye powers of the night! And while this sort of character is typically more like a villain, D&D gives you a chance to satisfy your dark curiosities and play one yourself. Perhaps it could be a flawed hero, or a dark anti-hero. Or perhaps you truly are a rotten bastard and your campaign allows for evil characters. Expanded spell list, first level. As with the Archfey and all the other patrons, you get spells added to your class list, which as I stated before, would be much better if you simply learned them for free. I mean, you're selling out your mortal soul here, you could at least get the damn infernal spells added into the deal. It's not like they're higher level than you could normally cast anyway, and you still have to spend your spell slots, so what gives? The Fiend spells are based around fire and devilish control, and include such greats as Command, Blindness, Scorching Ray, and Fireball. This sets the stage for the Fiend Pact being an aggressive, high offense character. Dark One's Blessing. Right out of the gates of hell, at first level you get this fantastic feature. Remember the criticisms I had about the Necromancer Wizard's Grim Harvest? I don't have any such gripes here. Whenever you kill a hostile creature, in any way, 
You gain temporary hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. Awesome. It's simple. It's easy to remember. It scales throughout your entire Warlock lifespan. Also, the flavor text of a devilish character reaping bits of life force from his foes is very fitting. It's good for a ranged caster warlock, and it's just as good, if not even better, for a melee warlock. Dark One's Own Luck, 6th level. When you make an ability check or saving throw, you can add a d10 to increase the roll. It doesn't even use your reaction. It's quite helpful, though it's not an end-all, be-all, and the fact that you can use it once each short rest is really what sells me on it. Fiendish Resilience, 10th level. The defense utility continues here. Every time you finish a short rest, you can choose one damage type and gain resistance against it. This is particularly good if you know what you're going to be up against. Oh, hello there, invisible flying imp familiar. Magic weapons and silver weapons do bypass this, but that's not the worst drawback ever. Fiendish Resilience is a solid feature and situationally could be something that saves your life. Hurl through hell, 14th level. Remember what I said about epic features at high levels? Yeah, this is it here. Once per long rest, when you hit a creature with an attack, you can send it hurtling through hell. It's only gone for one round, but if your party knows how to exploit a key enemy's absence during a battle, a lot can swing within the space of just one round, especially at 14th level and beyond. But it gets better. When that creature returns from its cannonball hell tour, as long as it's not a fiend itself, it takes 10d10 psychic damage. Holy shit. Actually, unholy shit. It's incredible. The fiend pact as a whole is a very strong contender here. Without tallying anything up yet, I'd say it feels stronger than the fey pact. Though I do like the fey pact too. Its theme and the story are just really different between the two. The Great Old One I was prone to late nights working as an archivist at the Hawthorne Library. The endless cataloging and filing of books was tedious enough, but in truth, it was my own damnable curiosity that kept me there far beyond waking hours, never satiated, no matter into how many volumes I glimpsed. What was I seeking? To this day, I cannot tell you what infernal hunger laid hold of my mind, but with each new tome that crossed my fingertips, my lust for ancient lore and esoterica only grew. It was during one such night, well past the city's last bell of the evening, that I stumbled upon a secret door in a dark corner of the library's undercroft. Trembling, I made my way through that lightless corridor, following echoes in a tongue I could not place. Nary to this day can I recall its aspect, only that it sent tendrils of dread through my ears, into my heart. Dread, and a feverish desire to behold what terrible secret had lay under the library grounds all this time. I came to the threshold of a subterranean chamber whose architect could not have been any mortal man. Impossible geometry encircled some alien shrine, and at its center was old man Hawthorne himself proprietor of the library. He stood entranced at an altar of some strange stone carven with faces that were neither person nor beast. It was then that I realized that the maddening utterances were issuing from his very gaping mouth, though his lips did not move. He stopped. Had I made a noise? A gasp, perhaps? Given away my presence? The elderly man's body held still as a statue, but his head, it turned, it swiveled back ways and glared directly at me. In that moment I perceived a host of eyes, gazes seizing upon me. I wished to flee, but my limbs did not respond. A dozen clammy appendages took hold of me and hauled me off to that awful altar of visages. The voice louder and shriller than before, reverberated through the bleak space. The syllables were beyond all comprehension, yet at that moment came another voice clear, directly within my own brain, asking, Shall you serve, or shall you die? Serve, I whimpered. 
terror wrung at the core of my being, and I said what little I could to preserve my own life. All fell away to spinning darkness, and I have no further recollection of that night. I awoke in my own bed, feeling refreshed, surprisingly invigorated. Something, some force was flowing through my veins, giving me fantastic new abilities, along with new urges. I dare not tell you the deeds I have done in the intervening months since that fateful night, for in the small hours of the twilight domain, I am not wholly myself, and the lust for knowledge that drove me has evolved into a desire more tenebrous than I could have ever imagined possible. Each morning when I awake, I wonder within the silence of my soul if, upon that horrid altar, I should have chosen death. It is not too late to undo this madness. Madness. You thought that striking a bargain with a devil was a bad idea? How about making a pact with a mysterious entity from beyond the stars? One whose motives you cannot perceive. Is it the consciousness of a dead god from an alien world? Or is it an elder monstrosity who grew to heights of power in a forgotten age? Whatever it is, whatever it wants, it's your patron now, and things are going to get weird. Expanded Spell List, Level 1. The Great Old One's spells are mostly mental things, themed with madness, mind effects, and divination. For example, we have Dissonant Whispers, Hideous Laughter, and Clairvoyance. Awakened Mind, also Level 1. After seeing Fey Presence and Dark One's Blessing, the first level feature here comes as a bit of a disappointment. You get Telepathy with a 30-foot range. That's it. I don't hate it. It has some nice situational potential. Scout with a rogue without making any noise through speaking. Interrogate an NPC inside her own mind. That could freak her out. Or just mess around with NPCs in general. They wouldn't know who's talking in their head. You could maybe mimic their own voices, maybe drive them to do things by listening to the voice in their head. It's only a 30 foot distance though. I wish it was farther, and I really wish it came with some other effect, like a once per short rest or even once per long rest. You can try to telepathically control someone's mind. Entropic Ward, level six. Once per short rest as a reaction, when an enemy attacks you, you can impose disadvantage on the attack. If the attack misses you, you then gain advantage on your next attack roll against that enemy before the end of your next turn. I like the concept. Something seems a little missing here, or maybe just a tiny overcomplicated. If you're a ranged caster, as I imagine many great old one warlocks are, you may go through several encounters in which you rarely or maybe even never get attacked yourself. And then to utilize the advantage that you might gain, you have to use Eldritch Blast or maybe a weapon attack on your next turn. If you wanted to do something else, like cast a full spell or use an item, then that benefit just goes to waste. So yes, it's a good feature, but it should have been a little better. Thought Shield, level 10. Getting well into the mid-levels, closer to higher levels, you gain immunity to your thoughts being read by other creatures, and you have resistance to psychic damage. Also, whenever a creature deals psychic damage to you, it takes an equal amount. So again, this is a situational benefit. It's even more situational this time. Think of all your D&D characters. How often did an NPC try to read their thoughts? And how often did they take psychic damage? Yes, it does happen sooner or later, and when it does, you'll love having Thought Shield. But I bet you've also gone through lots of adventures in which these things never happened. Create Thrall, 14th level. The final feature of the Great Old One Warlock has a bit of a misleading name. You don't exactly create a Thrall, like how a Mind Flayer or an Aboleth does. You touch an incapacitated creature, and it becomes charmed by you until a. It receives Remove Curse. B. The Charmed Condition ends. Or C. You use this feature again. As an added benefit, you can telepathically communicate with the creature as long as you're both on the same plane of existence. Again, I have mixed feelings. I love the concept. This could situationally be really effective or interesting. But at 14th level, 
I think this should have been the sixth level feature. Even the first level feature, that would have been much better. By 14th level, it's not really too hard to control NPCs just as is. The characters are so strong and influential. Or if this truly has to remain a 14th level feature, it should have been stronger, like make it to where you actually create a thrall. Unfortunately, this pact kind of underwhelmed me. Great old one? Seems more like a lesser old one. It sucks because I love the theme, and I'm a fan of the old Lovecraft stories. So please don't take this in the wrong way. If you're interested in playing this kind of warlock, go for it. In fact, I could even see myself playing a great old one warlock because I think I could really make the best out of it, and I'm perfectly happy playing characters that are all about role playing and utility and peculiar skills. But this pact just isn't going to work for everyone. The Celestial. Viewed in a certain way, warlocks are similar to clerics. They receive abilities and boons from a powerful supernatural source. The celestial patron is as close to a cleric as a warlock gets. In this way, the warlock has bound himself to a great celestial being, such as an archangel, an empyrean, a kirin, a unicorn, and so forth. It's a big departure from what a warlock typically is. Heaven. So does it work? Does it come off as awkward? Is it justified because making a cleric warlock multiclass character is not so effective for a lot of people? Well, let's find out. Expanded spell list, first level. Like with all the other patrons, this feature would be much better if it simply added to your known spells instead of competing against all other warlock spells. As you probably guessed, these spells come from the Cleric list, such as Cure Wounds, Guiding Bolt, Lester Restoration, Revivify, Flame Strike. Well, Flaming Sphere is on here, so I guess that's not a standard Cleric spell. I have to say though, the spell list is quite good, and it really opens up a new dimension to the Warlock. Bonus Cantrips. Also at first level, you learn the Light and Sacred Flame Cantrips. It's nice. It's fitting uh, for the flavor of the Celestial Warlock, and really just serves as a little minor feature. It would have been cool to see something that turned Eldritch Blast into Radiant Damage, or maybe something that made Sacred Flame as good as Eldritch Blast. Oh well. Healing Light. Additionally, at first level, you receive Healing Light, a fantastic healing ability that works like something in between Healing Word and a Paladin's Lay on Hands. This is not a spell. It uses no spell slots. It's a bonus action, and it provides ranged healing. It's really, really good. Radiant Soul, 6th level. You now resist radiant damage, and when you deal radiant or fire damage with a spell, you can add your charisma modifier to the damage against one creature. Hmm. Well, it's not bad. It's decently good just really depends on what spells you choose and what creatures you end up fighting. Celestial Resilience, 10th level. Whenever you finish a short or a long rest, you gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier, and up to five other creatures gain the temps equal to half your level plus charisma. So at level 10, you'll probably get 14 temps and your allies nine. This is certainly useful, and it's something that you'll get to take advantage of all the time. Searing Vengeance, 14th level. Remember how Hurl Through Hell really caught our attention? Searing Vengeance is almost to that level. Once per day, when you make a death saving throw, you can instead automatically regain half of your hit points, spring to your feet, and release a 30-foot burst that deals 2d8 plus charisma radiant damage to your enemies, and blinds them, automatically blinds them until the end of turn. This is one of those features in which power and flavor meet together really well. I would rate this at S tier, but you do have to be dying for it to activate. So unless you're really playing kamikaze style, probably won't come up so often. I would say the Celestial Warlock impresses me. Impresses me more than I expected it would. 
It's a potent option in the fact that it gives you some relatively good healing on top of everything that a Warlock can already do makes this a really versatile character. The Hexblade. The powers of the Shadowfell run through the Hexblade, increasing his melee capabilities more than any other kind of Warlock, and making him into a dark necromancer mage warrior. The Dark Crystal. Expanded spell list, first level. The Hexblade's expanded spells include Shield, a few different Smites, Cone of Cold, and others. Shield is perfect, and really it's one of the best abjuration spells out there. But remember how limited your spell slots are, so it's going to have to really be worth it for you to use it. I wish there would have been a couple good necromancy spells on here as well, as this Shadowfell Warlock is almost like a cross between a necromancer wizard and a dark paladin. Hexblade's Curse, first level. Once per short rest as a bonus action, you can curse a target within 30 feet. Against the target, you deal extra damage on all attack rolls equal to your proficiency bonus. You score critical hits on a roll of 19 to 20, and if the target dies, you regain hit points equal to your Warlock level plus Charisma modifier. This is a wicked feature and notably increases the Hexblade's round-by-round -round offense against the cursed target, both with melee attacks and Eldritch Blast. Hex Warrior, also at first level. This is the baseline feature that really establishes what the Hexblade can do. You gain proficiency with medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. You can also bond with one one-handed weapon and use your charisma to attack with it instead of strength or dexterity. Furthermore, if you take the Pact of the Blade, you can use your Pact weapon for this purpose, and it can be two-handed. So, Hex Warrior, in and of itself, isn't anything groundbreaking, but it brings you to a level where you can hold your own in melee. Of course, you will be second to the primary warriors like Fighter, Barbarian, and Paladin. Accursed Spectre, 6th level. Your Shadowfell connection really starts to bloom here. Once per day, when you kill a humanoid, you can animate its spirit as a specter, which serves you until the end of your next long rest. The specter gets temporary hit points and a bonus to attack rolls that scale as you level, and the potential that this provides in role-playing, exploration, and in combat is great. What I love most about this feature is that it goes beyond simply generic passive benefits. It's really dynamic. It has a lot of style and it influences character development and storytelling, not to mention the moral repercussions of employing such necromantic manipulation. Armor of Hexes, 10th level. Here your curse reaches a whole other level. Whenever the cursed target hits you with an attack, even a critical hit, you can spend your reaction, roll a d6. On a 4 or higher, the attack misses. In other words, the cursed creature, in addition to having to hit you to begin with, also has a 50% miss chance on all its attacks. Master of Hexes, 14th level. Your curse improves once again here. Whenever your cursed target dies, you can transfer the curse onto a different creature within 30 feet of it. The new target does not give you the hit points when it dies, but otherwise all those other great effects apply to it. The only real drawback I can see with this is that the 30 feet range is kind of short. It's an unreliable factor. Depending upon what you're fighting and the terrain of the encounter, you might be able to transfer the curse onto the target that you prefer, or you might have to transfer it to a less ideal target, or you might not be able to transfer it at all. The Hexblade is a really standout subclass for the Warlock. I have to say, I am thoroughly impressed. It combines some serious power with thematic, story-driven features. The Undying. The next patron that we're going to take a look at in this ranking is the Undying, out of the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. I must admit, you don't hear much about this one. That does not bode well with me, as you tend to hear more about things that are done well. And this book also gave us some barbarian and wizard features that were underwhelming, so I'm going into this one with its bad reputation slightly tainting my perspective, but I'll do my best to give this an honest look. 
The Undying Patron is a lich, a great and elder lich, who possesses a wealth of arcane power and secrets, to whom you pledge your service. It's creepy and mysterious. This is the perfect setup for a warlock patron. <laughs> expanded spell list, first level. The Undying's expanded spell list embodies necromancy and crypt theme effects. From false life and ray of sickness, to blindness and silence, to feign death and speak with dead. The style is quite fitting, though I can imagine some people complaining that it's not strong enough. Among the Dead, first level. This feature provides three benefits in one. First, you learn the Spare the Dying cantrip. Second, you have advantage on all saving throws against disease. Third, you have a constant sanctuary type effect against all undead. So it's a lot of value out of just one single feature. And again, the style really fits the archetype. Defy Death, sixth level. With this feature, whenever you succeed on a death saving throw or stabilize someone with Spare the Dying, you regain hit points equal to 1d8 plus your constitution modifier. Hmm, it's pretty good, I suppose. Especially if you're the one who's dying, then you can come right back. But something is lacking for this to be the entire 6th level subclass feature. And you can only use it once per long rest. Hmm. Undying Nature, 10th level. You creep closer to being an undead yourself by this point. You can hold your breath indefinitely, which... I'm not quite sure how this is different from not needing to breathe. Anyhow, you also don't need food, water, or sleep, though you still have to take rests to gain the benefits of short rests and long rests. It makes no mention if you still have other bodily functions like burping, peeing, and crapping. You also age at one-tenth the rate and you cannot be magically aged. So on second thought, this seems almost more like a celestial theme here. It seems like your life is increasing, like you're becoming less of a typical mortal and more of an immortal living creature. So it's all interesting. And there's probably some creative ways to utilize these characteristics. It just really seems like you should get something else at 10th level here. Undying nature seems like a passive side benefit at this point. Indestructible life, 14th level. Once per day as a bonus action, you can regain hit points equal to 1d8 plus your warlock level. If you hold a severed body part of yours back in place when you do this, it reattaches. So, seems more like a troll warlock, not a lich. And honestly, if this would have been given at first level, no one would have known that this was actually intended for 14th level. So, I call that bad design. The effect isn't terrible. It's just implemented poorly and underwhelming. The name isn't even correct. It doesn't make you indestructible. It just makes you a little more tougher and able to reattach limbs on the off chance that one of them gets cut off, which it never does in 99% of all D&D &D campaigns as limb loss isn't part of the game's rules. Damn it, Undying, you're not good enough. I love the concept, but the design is lacking. There we go, folks. That's why you almost never hear anyone talk about this subclass. And we have yet another mediocre option out of the Skag book. Well, they can't all be Booming Blade. Next, we move on to the, uh, the patron of... Um, could have swore there was another Warlock patron. Apparently that's it. Uh, just six official published ones so far. Well, if you would like additional options for Warlocks and every other class and monsters too, check out my newsletter, Scrolls of the Bard. There is a free version every month, as well as the full version for patrons that has much more content and includes concepts given by the patrons themselves. I'll have links down in the video description as well as at the end of the video. <laughs> You who are watching this video, and not subscribed to Esper, don't be a fool. Imagine the endless amounts of inspiration dice you will receive. Embrace the power. Eldritch Blast the button of subscription. 
and toll the bell of awareness. Yes. Good. And now we are on to the ranking of the Warlock subclasses as compared to one another. In sixth place is the Undying. It's a great theme, but hit or miss features that start off strong and quickly go downhill. In fifth place, the Great Old One. Another wonderful theme, possibly my personal favorite, but the mechanics themselves will not work for everyone, nor every campaign. Fourth place, the Archfey. Effective, tricky, illusionist enchanter that could still function well as a blaster. Third place, the Celestial, the most versatile, and it's a unique blend of divine wrath and healing along with typical warlock tropes. Second place, the Fiend, potent, fiery, and ultimately the most classic kind of warlock. And first place goes to the Hexblade, which has an abundance of different benefits and abilities that make it a necromancer, a melee warrior, a blaster, and a controller all in one. When I think of the best 5e classes overall, the Warlock is certainly up there, perhaps coming up slightly short in the mechanics department compared to the full casters, but definitely capable of holding his own plus with a slew of unique customization options and some of the very best built-in role-playing and story hooks. It's safe to say that the Warlock is a player favorite in D&D, and it's clear to see why. Thank you everyone for watching, and a special invocation of gratitude to the adventurer to your patrons, Warser, Adam, Dennis, Vince, and Nick. Until next time, my brave companions, may your adventures be many.